Welcome to the Biomelons HealthCast, episode number 349. Hot flashes and night sweats. They're not always hormonal. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. One of the most common complaints that you get in your office, women that come in, and men sometimes, Mm -hmm. and say, I'm having these crazy hot flashes in the middle of the night. I wake up, and I'm sweating, and my sheets are drenched, and I kick the covers off. And then after a while, I get chilled and cold, and I cover back up, and then I wake up again, and and it's making me crazy, and I'm not sleeping well. Mm -hmm. And is it possible that that's caused by a hormonal imbalance? And you say, yes, it is. It's very possible that it's mm-hmm. caused by a hormonal If If you fit within these parameters, if, if this mm-hmm. is what's going on with and you. And I look at the lab and see right. if FSH and LH are the two hormones that are elevated. They surge or they're just they high? Sur- they're sur- they surge, and usually they have a high baseline. So mm-hmm. no matter when I test them, they're higher than normal. Okay. And if they're high... That's what gives you a hot flash. They affect the temperature center of your brain, and it gives you a hot surge, comes and goes. And some does people that come sweat. Out of the pituitary? Yeah. The does. FSH and, and the, the LH, LH get blasted out of the pituitary to regulate things that the body does. Well, actually, they're regulating your testicles and your ovaries. But when your ovaries aren't working, they're done when they hit menopause, or when testicles stop making as much testosterone as they need, or as many sperm as they need as we age. Then many men and women get these surges at night of their LH or their FSH that causes them to have these symptoms. Trying to go out and signal to the ovaries and the testes, hey, we need to be working. And we need more. They're, they're like, no, give us more we hormone. Got laid off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the ovary just retires. Yeah. The testicles just decrease working usually, and so it's just not enough. And when it's not enough for you as a person, meaning it kind of self t- tells me how much somebody needs. Right. No matter what your level is, if your FSH and LH are elevated, you don't have enough. Okay. So, so that. So then you restore that. We restore that. We give back estrogen and testosterone to women, sometimes progesterone, and we give back testosterone to men. And then we retest. Okay. And we look for FSH and LH to be really low because it's telling your brain, hey, we got enough. Stop pushing us. Okay. And, and for most people, that's all that it takes. And that's and then it. They, they stop having that symptom. Right. And then that's but over. Some people are still having that symptom. Or re- start having it again, start, start having, having the again. same similar symptoms mm-hmm. again. And they're like, hey, I, I'm not getting enough hormone because I've got these symptoms. Mm-hmm. And at that point, we retest the FSH and LH. We retest the estrogen and testosterone levels. And then we can tell them. This is from your hormones or it's not from your hormones. I mean, your sex hormones. So so if it's not from those, right. because your FSH and LH are the, quiet. The testes and ovaries. Right. The, if it's not because, you're, because you need more hormone, mm-hmm. then we can't just give you more hormone and make you happy because that's just not going to work. So we, we then look at many other things that cause night sweats and hot flashes. And, and the list is... Huge. I mean, we only we're only going to touch on a number of these, but you have to think about these options when you're us trying to take care of well, a patient because they just don't believe it. Before we start on testosterone, my wife and I both used to alternately have hot flashes. I mean, at different times, <laughs> and uh, when we went on testosterone, hers stopped. Mine didn't immediately, and. I was, I was on high blood pressure medicine. I had a high blood mm-hmm. pressure. Mm-hmm. So then you put me on a diet and exercise program and the testosterone, and my I was able to come off the blood pressure medicine yeah, when lost I lost weight. enough weight. Then I stopped having the hot flashes. Mm-hmm. So could it have been that the, the hot flashes were caused by blood pressure? Yes, it could be from it, it, high blood pressure things. surging at night because if you take your medicine in the morning, right. you may not Which have enough at night. Yeah. So if your blood pressure is surging at night, that's something you really need to know. Because you really need to change medicines, mm-hmm. something that lasts longer, or it could have been the medicine itself, 
it was it an ACE inhibitor? Yes, it was an and ACE inhibitor. So Lys- Lysinopril. Some, Lysinopril. some yeah. of those can cause hot flashes any time of the day. So oh, okay. that's that. not with everybody. It's an unusual kind of thing, especially in guys. So so that's the kind of thing we have to I'm an try. unusual kind of guy. I know. Yeah. I know. So, so we had to try changing things, and then they went away. Okay. So that was a little easier than most people because... When you have when you have blood pressure medicine and blood pressure, we kind of know that there could be side effects to that. Hot flashes or sweating could be some of them. So we look at, at that. But then my next thought, my next most common cause of a, of a, a we call it diaphoresis or sweating or being feeling hot. Um, it has to be in surges in general. It's not all the time you're hot. It's right. sweating. Yeah, it's not like the cold hands that you get with thyroid being out. Uh, right. It's like up and down, up and down, up and down. Right. So, is is an arrhythmia, and that you should have looked at because I and I had checked your pulse and it was always stable and it was always regular, but if you have a pulse that goes bump bump nothing nothing bump nothing bump 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 nothing, I mean, that can cause you to sweat, and that's a and that feels like a hot flash. Well, and so what you do with that, you don't treat that with hormones. You send them no. to a cardiologist. They go to a cardiologist a... because yeah. arrhythmias can be genetic. They can be they can be from medicines. They can be from heart damage. I mean, there's many causes of arrhythmias. Right. You have to see a cardiologist unless your primary care is very astute in cardiology, which some of them are. Right. Then you can go to your primary care. But but in general. They go straight to the cardiologist okay. if we find if that. If there's an arrhythmia. So you've already done the hormone balance with the testosterone or testosterone and estrogen. Mm-hmm. And if they still or they begin again to have hot flashes, then you want to send them to see if there's an arrhythmia. That's right. the next That's most or, common Or problem. a heart problem. Yeah. So sometimes um, you can feel hot and sweaty if you have not an arrhythmia, but a spasm. And women have more of these than men. A spasm of the arteries that lead to your heart, which is feel, it feels a lot like a heart attack. Mm-hmm. But women can feel like they're having a hot flash. So they pass it off. And, and you can have these, these types of uh, vasoconstriction that last. And it can damage your heart. So it's important to see a cardiologist for that. So when we think that... The hot flashes are from that. That's what we send them to. Here's what we've got. Here's here's what we need. Or they can do whatever they please. But yeah. make sure that my patient doesn't have a heart problem. Because to me, that's right. that's a huge emergency, and I don't want to miss that. Right. So we fix the hormones, rule out all, all of the hot flashes from that. They usually get about halfway better if they've got another problem. Mm-hmm. So that's something that, that we're concer- we get concerned about. But... The other things that can be that we usually can see a sign of is hepatitis. Hmm. So you may not know you have hepatitis, but if you have hot, hot any, any flashes, kind or all of them, any hepatitis, any hepatitis all, right. all of them, any of them uh, can cause hot sweats at night. Mm-hmm. But so can mono. Mono can cause you to sweat, have hot sweats at night. That's not your hormones. Lyme disease can do the same thing. So viral infections can all do that. Sometimes I can see that on a blood count. Sometimes I can't if it's been around a long time. Sometimes I can see it on liver studies. But the next step after the cardiologist is you have to go to your internist and rule out a whole bunch of other things. But if it's a viral infection, if you treat the virus or eventually just get over the virus, Mm -hmm. then the hot flashes should stop. Right, but viruses are very hard. If they've become chronic, uh-huh. And you have a virus for a very for a long time. You sometimes get chronic mono. If you just can't kill it really fast, you get chronic mono, and then you get hot flushes all the time. We call it Epstein Barr virus. Same virus, long term. Just long term. So and Hep C is very hard to treat. So and mm-hmm. the medicines are very expensive, and you have to go to a specialist for that. So if you have that. That's a whole new issue. We open a whole new page in your book, right. and you go to a different specialist. So some of these things we can test for and rule out. Another infection is TB that causes night sweats. TB. So we, you can do a skin test if I, it's you positive. Get them all time, yeah, you have to do it if you're a, um, 
a food uh, service worker or a school a doctor, teacher, nurse, doctor, nurse, anybody in medicine, right. anybody who has close contact with people, we have to have our, our TB tests yearly. Right. So, uh, so it's usually a skin test. If you react like allergy to the skin test, you can do a chest X-ray. There's some other tests you can do instead. Yeah, but they but, do the skin test first, and right. then if you have a reaction, then they ask for a chest X-ray. Right, and generally. We don't do either because that's not our our specialty. So we send that to their primary care, and they usually decide to do that for the hot sweats. Well, uh, autoimmune disorders and lupus and and fibromyalgia mm -hmm. also can cause this. Right. So. Uh, so the you, good news is testosterone usually makes them better, mm -hmm. makes those diseases better, mm -hmm. and. The night sweats from those usually get better with the treatment with testosterone, but not always. Not It doesn't always go away. That's one of those that we treat the disease. It's, they're, it's usually being treated already. And then we give patients testosterone, and the disease itself gets better, and the night sweats from both hormones and that get better. The, so, the, what is inflammation uh, inflammation involved with is, all of that? Yeah, inflammation is the issue. So lots of inflammation is going to be caught, can, can trigger your um, heat centers mm -hmm. in your brain. And then inflammation is really bad for you. It's more risky for heart disease and for uh, aging and for other diseases than is like cholesterol. So, so I'm, I'm very interested in looking for sources of inflammation. Right. And sources of inflammation increase your CRP. So Especially CRP inflammation is the within test. the body system, not like sometimes you get an injury and you'll see inflammation. It'll be right, just, it's protecting you. It's healing. Right. Inflammation, when it's in doing the right thing and when it's helping you, is is healing a wound or or it is fighting an infection. You need inflammation. You just don't need it all the time, and you don't need it at a high level. So, for inflammation that can cause these some hot surges, that can be from your teeth. And the most common, hmm. most common cause of inflammation that uh, that isn't evident on our testing is dental inflammation from from uh, infection in the gums. So we send people to the dentist quite often. Right. If they have a consistently high CRP, they're going to the dentist to get that cleaned up. They would never know right. that that was causing that can cause inflammation, so that it can cause heart disease. Actually, my dentist was telling me if you floss regularly, you can add five years to your life expectancy. True. And I'm like, and studies well, say why that. Why would you say that? Studies say. And, because, and he's, but that's he reduces true. Inflammation, yeah, there's reduces lots of study studies like that because yeah. inflammation, for no apparent reason except for your gums mm -hmm. can just circulate in your body and cause trouble everywhere. So you're overreacting to the rest of your body when you have gum inflammation. Mm -hmm. So I don't, floss kind of gives me that nails on the chalkboard thing. Right. So I've got one of those things that shoots air or water through. Like a water pick. So a water pick thing. Type so thing. Mm -hmm. it just like, and so if you hate flossing, that's a really good answer. So, cause, cause that works. It works better than flossing. What about, uh, like uh, this week was President Kennedy's hundredth birthday. Yeah, Kennedy had Addison's disease. Yes, uh, adrenal failure. Mm -hmm. Does that cause hot flashes? Yes, and that causes hot flashes by not making enough hormone hormones from the adrenal gland. So it's similar to the hot flash you get from not having enough estrogen, not enough or excuse me cortisol, not enough uh, epinephrine. The ACTH from your pituitary is trying to make your adrenal work. So is that a choline? No. No? Mm -mm. ACTH, what's ACTH. That? That's adrenal corticotropic hormone. All right. So ACTH surges, and it surges more at night than during the day, and your highest that makes your highest cortisol of the day in the morning. So if you have surges all night and you're sweating, that's one of the tests I do. While we're doing all these other testings and sending you to somebody else to, to get the other things covered, right. we look at ACTH to make sure you don't have a really high ACTH and a low cortisol. But we look at cortisol every time anyway, so we've got a clue. It's that. That it's cortisol. That it's, that it's the cortisol that's low and the ACTH that's So then high. you suggest that to the specialist or you just say, hey, we're getting these higher results? Uh, we usually try going. treating that to begin with, mm -hmm. not add true Addison's disease because it takes five drugs and, and a lot of endocrine mon monitoring. Right. But if it's just the cortisol, we usually, it's, it's more like adrenal fatigue, not Addison's. Mm -hmm. So we try to treat that 
We can treat it with a type of cortisol. We can treat it with um, adrenal from an an animal. Works. And and if you're treating it that way, then the hot flashes should go away. Right. So if the treatment's right, we get the answer because your hot flashes go away. Exactly. So that's that's one of those things that um, is so nice about doing what we do because we treat somebody with something and then whoop, symptoms gone. So there's you're working from a, a reduced list yes. of things. There there's are more. Mi- there's you more just things. Picking some of the more common mm-hmm. ones that you encounter. Mm-hmm. One of the ones you have is allergies, especially to alcohol. You, you're right. talking about consumption of alcohol drinks, or you're talking about alcohol? Like- no, alcohol like al- drinking alcohol. Okay. So many people. When they drink alcohol, one of their reactions, and there's, that's a genetic basis too, it's not something you acquire, you always have had this, is that when you drink alcohol, usually in the evening, people are going out, then they go to bed and they're flushing all night because they have an allergy to it. And they think they're having hot flashes. Yeah. But, and, but usually you ask them, when you drink alcohol, do you get all red? Uh-huh. And you feel kind of warm because it's worse when you're sleeping because you're under covers and you're not and you're not moving. But so they, they go, oh yeah, I do do that. I grew up in an alcoholic family, and there were a lot of drunks that were always around. <laughs> and I mean, I can't even imagine that my parents didn't uh, drink. Well, my, mine did pretty extensively, but there were a lot of people that came to the house and and who'd have these flushed red faces mm-hmm. and capillaries broken in. Oh, their that's nose a whole different cheeks. deal. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. <laughs> that's from liver damage. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's usually from liver damage. I'm talking about people who look totally normal. They take a drink, and then in about five minutes, they're just flushed. Uh, I'm glad you said it because I'm sitting here thinking back of you know, I know this person, no, that person. That's liver damage, and sometimes a really high red count mm-hmm. that has a lot to do with dehydration. I mean, there's a it's a complicated kind of kind of physiology. I just thought it was a marker But it starts with liver. It yeah, is. Seriously. Liver damage and broken blood it's vessels everywhere. Yeah. It, that's, yeah, that's okay. not, that's not good. Okay. You're pickling yourself literally. <laughs> <laughs> or you're not, but they were. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, but so, one of the other things that no one thinks about is um, low blood sugar. Mm-hmm. So many times. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But, but before you get high blood sugar, you get low blood sugar. So we get too much insulin, we overreact. So you eat a sugary meal or you drink alcohol, which has sugar in it, Mm -hmm. and not from the alcohol, but from the sugar, you go to bed and then about two o'clock in the morning, your blood sugar tanks and you get hot flushes you, and, and you feel terrible, you, you start sweating. So that's very common. I saw that when I used to do, um, in medical school, I used to do diabetic camps mm-hmm. for kids. And we would have to go around at two o'clock in the morning and wake everybody up because in, in a type one diabetic, if your blood sugar drops that much, you're sweating, but you're, right. you won't wake up. Right. So we had to wake them up. And if they were having, if they were sweating, right. if they were having, um, too low a blood sugar because we were doing all kinds of things like spelunking and we were, you know, repelling and we had lots of activities which would make a child's blood sugar drop in the in, at night. Yeah. So we would wake them up, see if they were sweating, see check, you know, check to see if they were alert. Because for type one, you don't want them to go into a sugar. Coma. No, no, no. That's that's deadly. Yeah. So we had so because yeah. of their increased activity, we had to make sure they ate enough. Right. And that their insulin wasn't too high. We'd figure out their insulin for the next day. Basically, based on what they they were going to do. Right. So that was something we did all the time, and I got to witness that in several children. Mm-hmm. That we then gave them orange juice and gave them something to bring their blood sugar up. But so you do that in the middle of night. You wake them up and say, mm-hmm. "Here, drink this orange yeah. juice and go back to bed." Mm-hmm. And we gave them glucagon if it was really bad. Yeah. Glucagon is the opposite of insulin. It it mo- meta- or it mobilizes a bunch of sugar from your liver. Mm-hmm. So it was it was a really good experience for me to get to see sure. this, and it was really fun too. Yeah, so, so just reading about it in a textbook. Yeah, yeah. reading about it in a textbook just yeah, doesn't tell you thing. that. But right. but but low blood sugar. With whether you're a diabetic or not a diabetic, if you have low blood sugar during the day, you might be sweating when it's low. And if you have it at night, it's worse. So what is the correlation there? The hot flash, the sense of heat, and the sweating, is your body trying to do what? Is that the FSH and LH trying to surge? <laughs> it's not those hormones. It's not, it's not the sex hormone stimulators. It's most probably insulin. I mean, the lack of the lack of insulin. I, I don't actually know what the the brain neurotransmitters on that. So what's I just to... know it it changes your 
heat sensors. And I think it's it's God's way of like telling us something's wrong. Okay. You know, I mean, if somebody's, if somebody's a diabetic, type one or two, and they start sweating at night, that's my first thought is hypoglycemia. Yeah. Okay. Either they're too much, they have too much of the medicine and they're waking up with a sweat or they didn't eat enough or they ate too much sugar. Okay. So the reason that we decided to have this conversation is because so many of the patients that come into the office of Bio Balance Health report symptomology of hot flashes and generally replacing and rebalancing their hormones, their sex hormones is a satisfactory treatment and they don't have hot flashes mm -hmm. anymore, but some of them still have hot flashes and they, they're initial response is to say, well, obviously my dose of testosterone is not high enough for estrogen. Or estrogen. It's not high enough. And so give me more. And they still continue to have hot flashes. And if we try a little more, it's it not may, a satisfactory it answer, yeah. but if we test them and see that it's not their sex hormones, right. then we have to say, this is not your sex hormones. You have something else going on. Or the hardest part is in patients who have been long-term patients mm -hmm. have been managed perfectly. Everything's great. And all of a sudden they get hot flashes. They mm -hmm. go, Oh, I must be getting used to my hormones. I must, must need right. some more. And that's when we find other things. Well, so then you, you need to go through this list and talk to them about their symptoms to figure out where to make a referral. Do I send mm -hmm. you to the heart doctor? Do I send you to the adrenal doctor? Do mm -hmm. I send you to the, the diabetes doctor yeah, to treat whatever this might well, be? Well, we usually know if they have diabetes. We usually know if they have they have insulin resistance or prediabetes. So, so we know that. We right. know if they've got thyroid disease anyway, their thyroid might be out of whack too. We didn't mention that. You monitor that. that all the time. Right. And we monitor the cortisol yearly. And in the first year, we order it twice. Mm -hmm. Then, and we look at all their pituitary hormones. So we know if they, we didn't mention a pituitary tumor, but that can cause it as well. So, and we know what medications are on. So we can rule out a lot of these things right. by changing a few things, changing one thing at a time and seeing if it goes right. away. Right. But some of the dip, more difficult ones, the TB, the viral infections, the um, autoimmune diseases, autoimmune stuff, right. usually they get better, but not always. And heart disease, we have to send to a specialist and we're a specialist in hormones, but not a specialist in those things. So we gladly are happy that there are specialists in those areas that can yeah. help our patients. Then they come back to us for hormones. Yes. So that's, I mean, that's one of the things that I really, really wanted to talk about because so many people go, no, 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 it's just my hormones. I just want you to do this. I don't, I don't want to do these other things. And it's hard to talk them See, into that. The ostrich syndrome. I'm going to bury my head in the sand. I know they don't want to have this stuff and I wouldn't either, but, <coughs> but, Granted, but we're the doctor. Mm -hmm. We're the doctor or nurse practitioner, and we're the ones that know uh, the other stuff it, really it could means. be. Yeah. And we aren't sure which thing it is, but we'll do what we can, and then we'll try yeah, to... Please, please don't get your medical advice from your next-door neighbor's cousin or from the <laughs> Internet on some flaming site of oh, disaster warning, warning, disaster. Yeah. Go talk to a trained professional. Have a relationship with somebody that spends some time with you and is concerned about your overall health picture, the holistic health look, and not just at solving a single symptom. If, if your doctor's approach to treatment is let's just get rid of this symptom and then we won't worry about anything else until you have another symptom, uh, especially as you age, that's not a satisfactory strategy. If I mean, my daughter, my daughter's a DO physician, which is like MD with a lot of preventive medicine and some other things. So it's additional training. They really grasp the whole person. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm an MD and I grasp the whole person. There's, there's, there's a bunch of They're us. They're out there. You can find them. But, but you have to go looking. And, and that, for that, yeah. you could ask your next door neighbor. So do you really like your doctor? Do you really get a good answer? Do you really, you know, do they look at everything and not just that one symptom? Right. I mean, usually self -ref or referrals from other people is our, our best No, I was thinking marketing. more of the, the incredible treatment strategy. You know, if, if you drink nine glasses of water every day, that'll solve your problem. You know, people say things like that to each other. Or they say, oh, my cousin Betsy took... Carter's little liver pills, and that went away. And so then, and, and I even. And so have then a they end up here, with something terrible, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. they didn't go seek out real help. Right. It's it is now. If I'm sitting next to somebody who they always ask me stuff. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking to a doctor who actually observes and is seen and has experiencing yeah. many, many, many things. That's a whole different conversation than talking to my 
Well, my receptionist knows almost everything I know, too. So a receptionist in somebody's office who's not been there very long, right. then that's probably not a good referral but or a, a good answer. You have to ask somebody who's really been around and has been trained, mm -hmm. had the 10,000 hours, the... Um, Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours of training, which we get in residency. I used to, I'm laughing because when uh, I had my private practice office and worked with uh, three other psychologists, the uh, the secretary that we hired to, to do all the paperwork was a secretary, a nice gal, but her education was in filing and typing and, mm -hmm. and filling out forms and so on. And we had to talk to her about not getting into detailed discussions <laughs> with patients about their diagnoses or about mm -hmm. treatments or about what the, what was going on in their lives. And she was just a good-hearted person who wanted right. to help. She was sweet. But that wasn't helping. So we had to, we had to counsel her about not doing that. Well, yeah, and we, you know, we do that as well. Yeah. But by the time, like, Angie's been with me, what, 20 years? Yeah. I mean, by the She's learned too, something. In she's learned a lot about yeah. what we do, and she can give some good triage answers. Sure. You can depend on that. But but you never know who you're talking to. If you, you start seeing somebody's practice, you don't know who's at the front desk. Right. So it's it's important to know who you're talking to and know what their background is before you take advice. And that's a, a, a good rule to live by. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.